Hey, this is a podcast. No, wait, it's a comedy podcast. Well, we tried to make it a comedy podcast. And uh, it's not meant to offend anyone. So don't get offended, okay? And wait, there's something else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listener discretion is advised. Audiomatic presents Our Last Week. Hi, Kodal. Hi, Paul. So, we are away from each other. Uh, you're in, yes. in uh, the western part of India and I'm in the eastern part of India. But yes. we are seeing each other's face. Yeah, we're on a Zoom call. Yeah. F- first we're time we are again. seeing each other's face on the podcast when we're away from each other. Early pandemic, we tried it and now, I mean, we generally do it over a phone. But now I think we're... I think you're missing my face. Now that's basically it. But you, know? you said that seeing my face, there's no added advantage. There's no benefit. It's a distraction. <laughs> it is. It is quite a distraction. Yeah, mm-hmm. I find generally on Zoom calls, you're in my field of vision, mm-hmm. you know, but I can look away and do other things. <laughs> you know, I can I can scribble. I can look at other stuff. But generally, everyone on Zoom calls have this pressure to stare at the screen. And, you know, it's that pressure of not taking your eyes off the screen because, like, especially in a in a group meeting, people are very scared of, like, looking distracted or looking away or engaging with someone else, you know. it's It seems rude almost. Whereas, actually, it's the most natural thing, right? Like, just to look away and not be in that conversation for a few minutes, talk to someone else, then come back to the conversation. But on a Zoom call, everyone is so focused on that screen. Like, they to, to take their eyes away also, they just kind of take their eyes away and then do that half sort of gesture to someone who's in the room. I just find that Zoom is a little bit more, uh, there's a lot more pressure to make a conversation work on Zoom. You know, if there was a Zoom call in real life, if yeah. people talked like that, it would be quite creepy, you know, yeah. to have 20 people just staring at your face. That's the thing that I, I just think that in a meeting, in like in a boardroom meeting, generally, like, you know, some guy is like, he's asleep. Some other fucker is doing a sketch of his dog. Someone is like picking his nose. Uh, and that's when you're in the room with people, you know, it's not <laughs> like, like, <laughs> but when you're when you're on the Zoom call, you feel this pressure. No, I mean, you can be in your shorts and you can be jerking off and all that stuff while the meeting is going on. Sure, but but you still have to look attentive, you know. Whereas actually, in a boardroom meeting and all, people are just lounging on some chair and they're just rocking back and forth and they're like, you know, they're showing their displeasure at the meeting. It's very different, I think. You see, if you're absolutely right, I think if human beings actually had to confront how we listen to each other which is yeah. most of the time we are there but we're not there you know we've zoned out we listen to people in little flashes <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah little bursts yeah. um the the difficulty of the phone zoom is mm. that i can't see your face to realize how much you're hating every minute of it you know like one of the joys yeah. of seeing yeah. your face is realize how weak Say some of the conundrums are. I can't see your face. The the yeah. disdain, the heat. That is why I like zooming. Yeah. So that you know how badly it's failing. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can sense it. So we can see each other and be like, this is going to hell. But yeah. at least it's like you're going to hell on a plane. You know, it's like the plane is running into mm. a mountain, but you're with the person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was it Homi Bhava, the... Great scientist, his plane ran into Mont Blanc, the Swiss mountain. Yeah. Homi Baba. Baba. Not Baba. What did I say? I think you said Homi Baba. <laughs> Homi. He was also Parsi. He was also Parsi, but his name was not Homi Baba. So his is Baba. Homi Baba. Homi Baba. Is, is Baba, Baba just a, a, a slang for Parsi? Yeah, Bawa. Kya jal rahe Bawa? <laughs> like how, how we'd say Bong for Bengali. Bawa is a thing for bong. Parsi. Parsi, yeah. So then he was Bawa Homi Baba. Yeah, <laughs> sort of.
but his plane uh, this there were there were um conspiracy theories and i think some of them have been admitted to also by the cia that they had to take him out they had to get him killed uh because he was uh, frontlining the the nuclear program and all of that so i think there has been some admission by the cia recently that uh they had to target this guy so this this plane crash could well be a conspiracy wow yeah because the facts the facts are i didn't know this it's believable because mm. i guess india those years i've i've i'm recently been obsessed with a lot of youtube uh clips of hmm. nehru talking to the bbc and american journalists in the 50s just to see what a contrast it is right you know just the, the it's, it's very articulate and stuff but you realize that nehru was quite like americans didn't know if he was on their side russians didn't know if he was on their side he was a mm. bit sort of an impractical socialist you know it's sort of like mm-hmm. you know why can't we have a third way you know or some nonsense he'd mm. always say so no one really trusted him but he was it was a different time for articulation he was so articulate and well spoken mm. and i know that he uh, had a lot of faith in homi bhaba and homi bhaba himself was an incredibly erudite speaker like those people were very good english speakers you know yeah i mean they were coming off I mean, they they were all products of that that time as well, right? I mean, to be educated in a certain way and to uh, to think a certain way. So yeah, a lot of those influences were there. I mean, yeah, one one of the uh, just off of Nehru, listening to Nehru speaking in that very article, and I'm st- I'll be honest with you, I'm still from that India that gets very impressed when English is spoken well. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I am that kind of leftover colonialist. That if you if you speak hmm. English well, somehow you should govern India. You know, it's that, <laughs> it's that Saint Stephen's, you know, Rhodes Scholar. I'm I'm a child of that. I don't laugh, you bastard. So are you, but <laughs> you can't laugh. No, no, no. I it's not that. It's just that I I I know, but I'm not I'm not as impressed by by good English. I'm. That's I, true. I mean, That's true. You've evolved. Uh, with india <laughs> not yeah. evolved this is not my like for me i i know that you know british guys speak they even they speak a lot of english but they talk a lot of shit also <laughs> yeah so it doesn't matter you know like how good your diction is or what language you speak in so like, so we fundamentally <laughs> discuss this because yeah, like yeah, i yeah. i can see the cynicism in many things but my yeah. one weakness that will eventually probably mm. get me killed and will be the reason i lose all my money the one weakness i have is for english spoken well hmm and it will yeah. be the further cause of my destruction you know each of us of have course, of course you know like say cocaine kill jim morrison when you walk down a street when you walk yeah. down a street anywhere in the world you know generally yeah. you have these uh these drug drug dealers or prostitutes who come up to people and say why don't you come here and you know some guys and you want some stuff you want some stuff your th- downfall will be uh excuse me sir <laughs> can i interest you <laughs> in yeah. Uh, yeah. three passages <laughs> of my poem <laughs> please come this way and and you uh, <laughs> you just be in awe on the street and you'll be like what yeah 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 i want that i want that and then you'll go <laughs> into some cd looking thing where they take all your money and then accuse you of all sorts of things so your downfall will be some guy on the street <laughs> yeah speaking perfect english you know if that happened imagine if that happened in bombay to you you know generally yeah. it's like You know there are people peddling all sorts of things, but you walking down the street will be some person just enunciating and saying some beautiful things and taking you for a ride. I'm saying, not will happen. It has happened. This is the story it of my life. Happened. You know, I have. In fact, you go around touring the world on the basis of people proposing to you in good English. That's it. For half the money, you know, when someone yeah. he says, "Sir, आप ये कर लो ना, show कर लो," and they'll offer me twice, it's just because he's uh, my own prejudice, my forced Nehruvian colonial hangover. I am, I'm in, yeah. I am the failure because of that, because I have yeah. spent. Sir, uh, sir, आप बस दस लाख में कर दीजिए. नहीं, I cannot do it. I can't do it. 
uh, you know, we have this show, Anurab, and uh, and it's a very low budget, and we're only paying twenty five thousand to each uh, of our artists. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. When when is the show? When is the show? <laughs> That's you, na, basically. You've just summed up ten years of my life. I I write for Bollywood and use that money for English theatre. So I mean, just think. <laughs> I'm already. I'm not. Not this will happen. This is happening. It this has happened. It is happening. And you know, everyone saying blame Nehru, blame Nehru. But th- this is now the moment you should actually be blaming him. Correct. But he could Correct. have taken us down a very different route. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. If Nehru, if Nehruvian India fucked anyone's people like us, you know, they yeah. told us, you know, be a little British, like English things, mm. speak properly, and then ruined us. And made us unfit for India. I'm saying, D, <laughs> if anyone should be angry, it should be us. It should be Modi. It, should be, it shouldn't be Modi, yeah. Kunal, very quickly before yes. we get into our conundrums this week, uh, right. why is it that neither one of us, wherever we are in the world, can find a decent piece of furniture on which to write or do our podcast? I mean, I know that this is sort of a petty gripe, but but you are in a hotel room and you have wobbly furniture. I am in my house in Calcutta and the desk I'm in is either too high or too low. I have the same problem in Bombay. We are in our 40s. We've done enough in life to have furniture. But none of it is suitable for our work. Not a single piece of furniture. Uh, what I figured with a lot of furniture <clears throat> is that, uh, especially in, in our country, there are many factors mm. that go into making a piece of furniture stable. And the first thing that that I like to notice about furniture is whether it's stable or not, like a chair, mm. a table, a sofa. Like if it's rickety or if it feels like, you know, it's it's wobbling or it's about to collapse, then, you know, then you, it just inspires no confidence. And I think that f- that in, in the case of our furniture, sometimes, most of the time, it's the case of the person who's made the furniture. You know, they've they've messed up the length of the legs or they haven't given it enough support for the legs. So the legs start like, you know, spaying out and then it gets uneven. But in our case, sometimes it's it's the floor also. You know, what I've noticed <laughs> yeah. is that, is that, yeah. is that they say, sir, furniture ka problem nahi hai. Aapka floor hi seedha nahi hai. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <"No>, this is... <laughs> This is another level now. You've taken it to the next level where I have to now worry about the flatness of the floor, then the steadiness of the furniture, and then, of course, the weight of the person who's going to be on that. Fu- so there are too many elements, I think, in in our situation where we have to now involve the floor's flatness also. The house I've just rented, the refrigerator hmm. came in and we put it and the refrigerator guy couldn't understand why he can't align it. And then he plugged it in. He did a bunch of things. Then he lay down hmm. on the floor. There's no way a refrigeration engineer should have to do these things. And started yeah. like feeling his way around the floor. Then yeah. sort of stood up and sighed. And said, oh, it's not the Korean company's fault. Your whole kitchen is at an angle. Yeah. You know, goes, so it, the, your your fridge is going to lean towards you for its whole life. For its, <laughs> it's whole, going to seem like it's going to fall on you. And only in India, when you're getting an appliance fixed, do you realize yeah. that your house is sinking. Hmm. Hmm. It could start there. <laughs> <laughs> it could start there. It could starts with an appliance, but then you slowly realize <laughs> that it's a much deeper problem. <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why every year your house is sinking. It's the fridge that told you. Yeah. So uh, we have a, a washing machine, mm-hmm. okay? And and washing machines are famous for going on walks. You know, like they they like especially because you have these little levelers at the bottom. You know, there's like a little screw that you have to you turn it and it increases and decreases the height of each leg of the washing machine. But you can never quite get it right because, you know, the floor is fucked and whatever, whatever. And and the washing machine, when it's drying, starts moving forward, you know, and at a strange angle, it, it starts shuddering and moving mm, in mm. its own sort of, it's just like, so what we've had to do is we've, you know, the, the, the pipe that leads uh, for the water to leave the washing machine, We've screwed it onto the wall. So now it's become like a leash for the washing machine. Yeah, we have so, to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, one sec, one sec, you're not going anywhere. I'm holding you back. 
<laughs> so, and it's all because the floor is not level. You know, it starts with the floor not being level. Now, how how do you you know these are very difficult things to to figure I out. I just I just got this done, and which raises a, a bigger question, which is there's no washing machine that is available for purchase in India, which as an appliance fits into any water outlet existing in India, meaning there hmm. is no hmm. way you will not need a plumber. And that plumber will yeah. always have to do something, an extra nozzle or some sort of a washer or sim- like in our Drill case. Drill a hole in a wall. Yeah, exactly. In our case, he cemented that pipe. I assume because he's worried that the washing machine will hmm. take off, like go off somewhere. Yeah, yeah. This cannot be a global yeah. problem. There can't be families in the US worried that their washing machine will end up with their neighbors. Yeah. And and I I think that generally, like you know when you ask these guys, अरे तूने अपना floor लगाया एक सीधा नहीं लगाया देखो ना sloping sloping लगाया या ऊपर नीचे है up and down as you yeah you hear all sorts of excuses sir वो material वाले ना वो एक tile जाड़ा एक tile पतला देते हैं material में problem होता है cement का problem होता है some person also told me that sir दुनिया ही goal है the whole world is only round <laughs> <laughs> दुनिया एकदम गोल है उस पर आप सीधा क्यों लगाना चाहते वर्ल्ड इज एन ओब्लेट आई थिंक राइट द्लैनेट द टॉप्स आर फ्लैट बट एवरी थिंग एल्स इज राउंड वाई डू यू वाई डू वॉन्ट अ फ्लैट सर्फेस एट ऑल वाई वॉन्ट फ्लैट द होल वर्ल्ड इज ओनली नॉट फ्लैट दिस इज डी डीप सो डीप But my last question is: Do you think the reason apartments in Mumbai have a separate, sometimes the new buildings have a separate washer dryer area? You know those hmm. those they create a little area behind the kitchen just for yeah. the washing machine, and there's a water. Do you think they do that because they know washing machines in India like to go for a walk? They know that yeah. they're not going to stay stable. They're just going to move around. It's also, you see, it's also what I found is that it's a it's a good idea. It's a very good idea because it is the messiest part of your home. You know, mm. your dirty clothes are there. Then you have to dry the dirty clothes. Then of course the washing machine is going to have to. You know, it, it it's like a dog almost. It wants to go out of the house. It wants yeah. to leave. It has to take a piss, and. It's you know generally next to some window area, so your clothes can dry if you want to dry them physically, or if you have a dryer, then it's a separate thing. But it's a good idea to keep them uh, like you know just create an area because sometimes when the washing see in most houses, washing machines came much later, right? Like yeah. say you have an older house from the seventies, eighties. Washing machines started becoming a thing only in the nineties, right? And Correct. early two thousands. Correct. So there was no space assigned for it. because generally it would be a person in one of the rooms soaking clothes and washing it physically yes this washing machine so so now the newer flats of course now are figuring out that of course we need a space for the washing machine but now if you're trying to accommodate it in one of these older buildings it's generally right next to you when you're taking a dump you know your basically your washing machine is on your because it's in one of your toilets right kunal you'll see it in the new flat it's when you open the door to our house literally when you open yeah. the door that's the oh, the first thing you see is the washing machine because that's where the water yeah. tap they they don't know where else to put it so the owners have just put it there that's ridiculous and just to make it less disgusting they've just put a door there <laughs> so you don't have to see the washing machine they just put a door right but it's there in the middle in the just walk in the first thing you see is the washing machine and yeah, if it's that's on that's imagine if you've got a guest he walks in and all he'll see is that's all he's going to see i'm leaving so, uh, i'm leaving a... <laughs> i'm leaving <laughs> okay we've talked rubbish for very long so i'll quickly ask you some conundrums first conundrum very quickly yes how do you feel about children between the ages of 1 and 5 being hmm. made to wear squeaky shoes by their parents in india as a way of not getting lost you see well, you you know what i'm talking about right like you see that airports and rail stations and everywhere malls yeah 
Indian yeah. kids are made to wear children are made to wear squeaky shoes shoes that make a noise they make a noise like that exactly like that and the goal is yeah. so that the child is not lost or if it's lost you can hear it um, you know i i just think that i don't know whether it's about lost or not i think the primary thing again is uh, to irritate people Yeah. it is to basically say and and it's like a fridge you know yeah. like a yeah. fridge or a tv like see i have a child i have a child you know i have Quack. a child and this child is going to <laughs> make, make it's make this noise happy. even even when the child is not saying anything or crying it still has the ability to irritate you know that is what basically you're saying is that is that my child can irritate you without saying a word <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's like good to, he yeah. doesn't have to open his mouth he was so quiet through the whole flight but he, even if he runs up and down the aisle you'll get screwed we bought him shoes just so he can irritate you yeah <laughs> yeah i mean so many children wear it that you know that that you that you could you could be on a wild goose chase you know like you would just be chasing the wrong sound yeah you know? so you come home with someone else uska chu chu nahi tha uska chu chu nahi tha uska chuwi chuwi tha chuwi chuwi <laughs> you just come home with a similar looking child that's not yours yeah yeah and i think that the way in which we used to traditionally do it in villages and in smaller towns was that i don't care you know that was much easier <laughs> it's like just run away you know and then yeah. finally you'll just find your way back because you know there were weren't these fears is someone's going to pick them up they're going to be kidnapped they're going to be sodomized i mean the, the, those fears were not as strong in a village they, you're in a field you're doing your work a little five year old is running around for 5 kilometers radius they can just be anywhere you know parents would worry about that part. at the end of it at the thing is raja Yeah. <laughs> and you shout something and they'd come running back yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. pretty simple and straight forward so i think that you know we've messed it up in cities where you know uh, we have too many things to deal with and you know it's unfortunate i've the better days those yeah. were better days could our last conundrum yes. very quick conundrum yes uh, you had a, a conundrum about indians being daredevil and gango in the wrong environment Uh, you had a recent yeah, holiday. I, Can you tell us about your recent I, holiday? I did. I did. I I did that lovely drive from uh, Srinagar to Leh on the Srinagar Leh Highway, going all the way up to the Nubra Valley, and we stopped at Sonmarg, which is pretty touristy, and we went on these little pony rides. Like they're pony, or they're, they're horses, really. They're small horses. I guess they're ponies. Um, and you you do like a one hour sort of little toodle to this glacier. and it's very cold there so they give you these big gumboots and they give you a a coat to wear on top of your coat so it protects you from the rain and you're already you know in two three layers of whatever warm clothing and it's cold it's i mean as you go even closer up that hill it gets it gets much colder and and it even started uh, snowing a bit and then raining a little hailish kind of rain so it was it was pretty damn cold and we were there and we didn't want to go too far to where the tourists were so we stopped a little bit before that and we saw this family who didn't want to take the ponies because i guess they were saving money but they had no cold clothes on they had no raincoat they had no inners they had no jacket the the the, the little boy who must have been 8 or 9 was in a t-shirt and pajamas with chappals and uh, they were using a uh, some sort of uh, like some sort of dupatta to cover the head and the man was in a in another he was in t-shirts and a sh- and shorts and they had another daughter who was freezing to the and they were pushing on you know they were pushing through this and it was like the the, the ground was a little wet and like mushy and they were stepping through this ice cold water and i was thinking that you know th- these children could die this is this is very very cold and and, and they're not used and, to, they, to they were shivering to clarify to our listeners this is not like we're not being insensitive like this wasn't a financial reason it was no i don't uh, think so they were clearly in sonmarg they were they were on holiday you know, they, yeah. they had enough money to get there from and from prob- uh, a distant land you know they didn't look like people who were from uh the region for sure so so clearly they had made a trip they had made a journey you know 
and they've come all this way and they're staying in this touristy place and they still wanted to i don't know they didn't want to pay like it was 2000 rupees to hire a horse and you know with all the equipment and everything i guess they didn't want to pay that little extra and they said ki kar lenge yaar ho jayega yaar apne bachche kya hoega idhar kuch nahi hoega you know kuch nahi thoda sa thand hai kuch nahi chalo glacier dekhte hain chappal se kuch kuch nahi chala you know so, so we have that you say we we <laughs> We we save yeah. we try to save money on the silliest things. We do it everywhere. I went to a castle once in Scotland, and there were three sets of Indian families. And the at the door hmm. they said, you know, if you walk around, it's just a ruin. Hmm. So the tour costs one pound. So please sign up for the hmm. tour. This was a family that had spent loads of money. They went into the castle, and obviously it's just a ruin. So unless you take the tour as the tour guide, you won't know what's sense, going on. Yeah. So everyone else is in the tour, and now this family is on their own, but just slyly trying to sneak in to be as near to the tour as possible, so they can hear. And you know that's what I found is that actually for an Indian family, the fun is not in knowing what the castle is. Yeah. The fun is in saving the one pound. The fun the is in pound. sending your son or your daughter and saying, "Yeah, just just go, just go see what they're saying, see what they're saying, and come back and tell me. <laughs> come back and tell yeah. me what they're saying." So the daughter <laughs> yeah. will go or the son will go. They'll hear, and then they'll come. They'll hear two sentences. They say, "Papa, it was built in 1567." Ah, see. <laughs> Good. Now you. Now know. we know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They said different no, people, <laughs> just for a pound. So the learning for the child and for the family is very different. It's not learning about the place. It's learning about how to hustle to know about the place. Yeah. So that's yeah. the learning. We don't want to. We're not interested in the history really. We're interested in how we can fuck this system that you have created to give me this information so that I can get it for free. And once I've learned that, then that is the story I'm going to tell when I go back to India. Also, <laughs> it's not about the castle. It's never do you hear that? Oh, there was this wonderful castle, and in you know it was built in 1567. It's more about अरे don't go there ना huh? those chutias will try and take one pound of you. What do you do ना? Huh? <laughs> it's that. <laughs> And, they, and on that, on that, there were dead horses and all on that glacier. Like I passed two dead horses. Really? That had died that day. It was cold. And then there's this family just running around in. in But you know what? It's it's an it's an Indian horse, <clears throat> so it probably came on holiday also. <clears throat> tried to save yeah. money and got fucked. And got <laughs> fucked. Yeah. It came with a family yeah. of horses saying, "I'm not paying like these other horses. Fuck it." <laughs> it that's what happened. Kunal, this has been our last week. Isn't it better to see each other? It's good. It's good to see you, Paul. It's good to see you. I'm so not really is what you're saying. Like, you're not really is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, I'm just saying. Not, yeah. not so yeah, much yeah. better. Yeah. In fact, the whole reason you took this film job, whatever you're on now, is so we don't have to meet in Bombay. Yeah, I was looking forward to not seeing you for you know <laughs> for three months, weeks or yeah. four weeks or whatever. Fucking yeah. Zoom! I'm telling you, man, the bastards. Messes up everything. So, uh, listeners, please send us your travel and holiday insights if you've got any. Please yes. let us know, and we'd love to discuss them. We're at our last week at automatic dot in, uh, and we're also on Patreon, Patreon dot com forward slash our last week. Yes. So, uh, do subscribe, and you get an extra episode every month, and you also get your conundrums answered. So, do consider subscribing and spread the word. And the moment it gets a little less hot, we'll try to do a live show in Bombay, hundred percent. Yes, yes, we shall keep you in the loop, and we will see you in person. Bye, bye. You were listening to our last week, produced by Rajesh Tahil and Avdut Khanolkar, hosted by Anuva Pal and Kunal Roy Kapoor, assistant producer Akanksha Kadam.